Plankton and planarian flatworms, which is the model organism we've been working with in my research group. Um, in our lab, these are the questions that we think about um, uh, when we have time and space to, to think broadly. But at the bottom, we sort of dissolve this, how does regeneration work, how does it evolve, and how do, what are, how do the stem cells that power regeneration evolve, and how they're re regulated into really one quick key question, which is, what are the stem cell behaviors that drive regeneration, and how are they re regulated? So this is, um, as a kid, this is a comic I used to read a lot, and it captured my imagination. Of course, we're a long way from this, but the point I want to make is that our view of regeneration in the animal kingdom is a little bit warped by the main model organisms that we've used. So C. elegans, eh, not very good. Drosophila, maybe a little bit. Uh, mice, as we just heard, for some tissues, highly regenerative. In fact, we are highly regenerative, and you're sat there making billions of new blood cells. But there are some things we can't do. So just take you through some examples. So these are urodial amphibians that can do limb regeneration. This is a classical research image that I use in Oxford undergraduate interviews. Uh, which demonstrates the point that during animal regeneration, you're able to sense what's missing and just replace missing structures. So on one side, you just have to make a wrist and a hand, and on the other, you have to make an elbow, a wrist, and a hand. Um, not clear how limb regeneration in a tetrapod is really adaptive. Like, why would this be a good thing to do? If you're down to three legs, you don't probably have that long to regenerate your legs. But there are many examples of regeneration that are adaptive. Here's a sea cu cucumber. It eviscerates itself, pushes off in one direction, leaves its guts behind to distract a predator. You'll have seen this if you've been to any beaches with um, starfish on. Starfish can regenerate their limbs, probably in response to partial regeneration. And whole body regeneration gets used as a reproductive tool. So here's an annelid worm that's about to split. And because it can do whole body regeneration, it can co-op that into a mode of reproduction. And there is a cost to regeneration because sometimes it can go wrong. So here's an example in a gecko where something's gone wrong in early regeneration and now you've got two tails. So this, this gecko's probably got rid of its tail in response to a predator and then something's gone wrong. Um, and just circling back around to mammals, you know, there are examples of profound regeneration in mammals. Here's the African spiny mouse has become a model of regeneration. So whether regeneration is an emergent property of some other life history features or whether it's adaptive has to be thought about in each lineage in each case. So um, my colleagues and I focus on regeneration in planarian flatworms that have been a model of regeneration for over 200 years, perhaps most famously by Thomas Hunt Morgan before he invented genetics using flies. And just looking at their anatomy here, the thing we're focusing on today are these cells here labeled in yellow which are through the whole body, and they're the only cycling cells in the body and are, in fact, the stem cells. And if they're in the cell cycle in uh, M phase, you can label them with antibody to mitotic cells. Classically, we call these cells neoblasts, and they give rise to all the other tissues or all the other organs in the animal in an ongoing um, homeostatic manner. But it also, as you'll see in a minute, gives these animals the capacity to do whole body regeneration. If we look more closely at these stem cells, they look like animal stem cells. They're small, they have a large nucleus. And as in many other animals capable of whole body regeneration, these stem cells have what we call chromatoid bodies. These are RNA protein-rich granules around the nucleus that have the same molecular components as germplasm in um, other animals. So these are markers of germ stem cells in the germline, suggesting that those cells and these cells have a common origin at some point in evolution and might explain why um, at least some of these stem cells in planarians and some of these other animals that have them, at least some of them, some of them that we know are pluripotent. So the way we do experiments is to decapitate the animals. We get uh, a wound healing process that, that makes the wound area as small as possible. And over the subsequent days, you form this unpigmented tissue, which is the regenerative blastema. And this is made up of cells that have left the cell cycle, are post-mitotic, until about three or four days, there's, a, there's no cell division in this area. And it's, so they're stem cell progeny that have migrated to form this blastema. And they will differentiate in an organized manner, in this case, to remake the whole um, brain and uh, anterior central nervous system. You can see which is part of the same here. Um, 
Okay, there's the stem cells again. So in asexual planarians, this method, this regenerative capacity has been co-opted to become a way to reproduce, but they do that by sticking the tail down, pulling, and then they bud off. So you get an animal, a little bud here, which will make a new head and a new pharynx and a new feeding apparatus, and this headpiece will just make a new tail. And that's how they reproduce in our cultures. Another feature of these animals to think about them because of this plasticity is that they're incredibly homeostatic, so we can starve and feed them and they all shrink over a, a log scale um, and keep all their organs and tissues perfectly scaled right down to a, a kind of a minimum size. The way we get hold of the stem cells, uh, for the most part, is using cell sorting with a very simple method. We filter the cells to select the small cells, and within these small cells, we know that there are cells that are in G2N, so they have more DNA. Um, there are cells that are um, in G1 and are undifferentiated. Um, and we call this compartment X2 for some reason that is lost to history. And then we have a compartment of cells that are called X insensitive, meaning that if we use irradiation, we don't remove them. So if we use gamma irradiation, we kill all the stem cells and the cytokine cells. We then use this comp lose this compartment too, because these are transit progeny that have left the cell cycle and they will disappear a little more slowly. But these insensitive cells are differentiated, so they'll stay in place. And we know that at least some of these stem cells are pluripotent because we can take a single cell and we can inject it into an animal and it will rescue the whole animal. So that cell can maintain the whole animal. And from that animal that you've rescued with one cell, you can actually generate a whole colony of animals. So that's, um, that's definitely a stem cell and it's definitely pluripotent. So now we think about um, how these stem cells are regulated down all these different lineages to produce these different tissues. I don't have time to go into all of them, but essentially at some, what we think at the moment is that at some point in SG2M, they will switch on fate-specific transcription factors for a particular lineage, which are functionally we know through experiments are important to generate these lineages. Um, and it's not clear yet whether these cells are new, but it, certainly in some cases they retain to a state where they don't express these transcription factors, so potentially they become pluripotent again. So from an epigenic perspective, uh, what we like to do is sort cells. Um, in this case, here's a near blast. You can see the chromatoid bodies around the nucleus, and we can subject them to epigenomic experiments. Um, I'm not going to talk about those too much today, but just as an example of the kind of question we can ask, here's one. Uh, we asked a while ago whether the pluripotent stem cells and planarians use promoter bivalency, similar to other stem cells or mammalian uh, embryonic stem cells. So promoter bivalency is the idea that you have both active and suppressive marks at the same time on a gene, so it's poised to take off during differentiation. So we wanted to know if this way of gene regulation, which is important in MET, is also important in, 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 in planarian stem cells. Um, and these promoters are also characterized by the presence of RNA pole 2 So the way we do that is we look at genes that are gonna, are gonna switch on in this progeny compartment, in this X2 compartment, but are off in the stem cells, because we know they're going to switch on a, uh, uh, as the stem cells start to differentiate. So we can do, um, oops. So we can do chip seek experiments in stem cells. We can look at genes that are enriched in stem cells for expression. We can say they have uh, uh, activating mark, but very little suppressive mark. Conversely, if you look at genes that are off, definitively off in stem cells and only switch on in differentiated cells, the reverse is true. But at these genes that are going to switch on imminently upon differentiation, we can see we have higher levels of both the, the activating and suppressive mark. Um, and we can look also, for example, at pause pole 2 and find the same pattern, that at these promoters that are going to switch on and give you active transcription upon differentiation, we actually see pause polymerase. So this feature of mouse embryonic stem cells is also a feature of stem cells in the planarian. We would argue that it's probably a conserved feature that is quite basal to animals. Okay, so that's an example of epigenetic work, and now I'm going to look at more cell biological work, because um, I thought this audience would find it interesting. So this is work done by Sunak Sahu and Prasad Navi um, in collaboration. So I'm going to quickly go through the two projects they were doing that then brought them together to collaborate on the, the data I probably want to focus more on. So Sunak was interested on the, in the fact that planarians have a relatively high resistance to ionizing radiation. And that's because at high doses of irradiation, some stem cells stick around, they don't die, and they're competent to repopulate the animal, and the animals are fine. 
So up to about 15 gray, um, it's a still a sublethal dose. At 20 gray, you still have some stem cells left, but they're not competent to repopulate, and those animals all die. By analogy, you or I could probably take 1.5 gray a whole body of radiation before we'd be toast. So this is, this is good. This is a good level of resistance and surprising in a population of stem cells that are constantly cycling. Um, and this is just the same, just to show that it takes about three days before these cells are competent to re-enter the cell cycle after exposure. So um, they start to be populated about 72 hours. So during that time, they're doing something that allows them to survive, maintain potency, and re-enter the cell cycle. Um, uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, so we developed some tools to look at the DNA damage after ionizing radiation, where the SUNUC did. So an antibody, a RAD51 antibody that um, measures damage in cells um, over the first uh, day or so. And then um, an antibody to poly-ATP ribose that actually measures very acute damage. Um, and so here you have um, damage in stem cells measured by poly-ATP ribose staining and damage in non-stem cells. This is just using an antibody marker that allows us to label stem cells. And you can see that this level of uh, poly-ATP ribose is very high immediately after exposure to ionizing radiation and then it decreases over the first day. Looking in the genome of planarians and other helminths, you can see that the DNA damage repair pathways are, uh, for all intents and purposes, conserved. There's a few losses here, uh, which are interesting. So in our major genetic assay is to inject um, double-stranded RNA into the gut and use that as a way of knocking down gene expression. And that has some disadvantages and some advantages. So one disadvantage is we're never going to get a complete null but then also the fact that you don't get a complete null can be useful to study certain aspects of these animals. So if we look at the effect of knocking down DNA repair pathways in unarrayed animals, actually the animals are fine, and we have to knock them down in pairs before we see any effect on stem cell numbers. Okay. On the other hand, if we combine, um, irradi um, if we combine irradiation with this assay, we can see then these animals don't survive. So with ionizing radiation, you need all these active DNA repair pathways. You can't afford to lose any of them. So one thing we're really interested in now is looking at the regulation of how these stem cells can survive this really high dose. What mechanisms are they using to do this? Um, so we started looking at the regulation of gene expression in near blast. So here's just an example of showing how it's disrupted. So you can see really nice RNA velocity um, trajectories across the near blast lineage into differentiating cells. So after irradiation, this is quite a low dose, but after about 24 hours, you can see that RNA velocity signal has been lost completely, so there's dysregulation. We can look at it on a more gene-centric approach. We find lots of genes that, I don't have time to tell you why we think they're interesting, but they are, and we can show that all of these genes are necessary for surviving um, this ionizing radiation dose. Um, some of them are clearly involved in DNA damage repair, but others are not. They don't have any known roles in DNA repair. So it's a way of understanding how this animal has adapted to have this capacity, which we think is an emergent property. They don't, they don't, res they don't experience this kind of damaging dose naturally. So that was Sunuk's project, and Passage's project was slightly different. He was interested in stem cell migration, and he did this by essentially inventing a, an assay that allows you to leave behind a stripe of stem cells in the animal using polymated x-rays. Um, and then he would make a wound and then use lots of uh, methods to track migration to the wound. So these, these cells will just stay here until you make a wound at the anterior posterior and then they'll migrate towards that wound. And we can measure the, the kinetics of that approach very accurately, uh, of that migration very accurately. We can show the migration really is very accurate because we can like, for example, put a poke in the animal in the midline or a poke to the side, or a little notch, and we can see the stem cells migrate, the stem cells and their progeny migrate very accurately to this wound. And we know that these stem cells here in green and their progeny here in pink will make these processes as they're migrating. So the presence of these processes correlate with active migration. Um, cells that are not migrating stay rounded. So this is an active migration process. And finally, we can show that it's actually EMT, so epithelial to mesenchymal tr uh, transition, transcription factors like snail and zeb, et cetera, that are controlling this process. So it's not using any, any novel machinery in terms of regulation, because we can knock down uh, snail orthologs or zeb1, and we, we reduce the amount of migration, and we also reduce the formation of processes. So these are these two projects.
Um, and they came together because we realized during this work that a lot of labs were publishing papers, very interesting papers, about how pushing cells through small gaps or forcing them to the migrate can damage the genome. But all of these experiments were being done in vivo, um, in vitro or ex vivo, and then cells being put back in. And we asked the question, well, is there evidence that this happens naturally in migrating stem cells? So during regeneration, cells are going to have to migrate to some extent. Um, and so is this like an unforeseen cost of this process? We think of damage to the genome or mutations occurring during because uh, of replicative stress, but is migration an, un, an un, unknown source um, of stress? So with these two different projects um, and sort of reading these papers, these two decided to get together and see if they could um, answer this question. So the first thing they did is to look at the nuclei of migrating stem cells to see if the nucleus itself has changed shape. And you do this simply by measuring the kind of width and length of nuclei in migrating regions against. So here's a shielded region. So this region has been shielded for, uh, from ionizing radiation to allow you to create this clear path. And then you look at the shape of nuclei in the shield against the shape of nuclei in the migrating root region. Um, and you can see that actually the, the nuclear shape of these stem cells, it's not just the fact that the cytoplasm changes shape and you get an extension, the actual nucleus changes shape, suggesting there is a potential for stress on the nucleus. If we look at acute damage with poly, poly ADP ribose, we can see that as cells are at their kind of migratory maximum, um, they have increased levels of acute damage, not at other times. And of course, the non-stem cells don't have this because they're not receiving any damage because they're not migrating. So this suggested there was increased um, genome instability in migrating cells. Um, and we wanted to test if this was biologically significant or is it just something that they don't mind. And to do this, we went back to using um, the kind of manipulative experiments that you can do in our system rather easily by using more irradiation. So the first thing we hypothesized that if we preload cells in this shield with extra damage, this might slow down their migration if migration has an impact on, if, if the radiation or DNA damage interacts with active migration. So in this experiment, we set up a migratory assay and we add an extra dose of uh, damage to the cells and then we ask how do they migrate compared to um, the normal situation. And in fact, what you see is that migration is, is really retarded in a, in a, in a in a dose-dependent manner. So these animals will all be okay because the cells repair the damage and they migrate and everything's fine, but it happens more slowly because they have to wait to repair this damage. So this tells us that if you already have damage, you can't migrate actively. You have to wait till it's repaired. Um, then we asked, well, if the, if the DNA damage itself is important, then it should sensitize cells to further damage if it's a load on the system. Um, and to do this, we reversed the timing of the experiment, so now we asked stem cells to migrate to a wound, but now we added radiation on top to see if the migrating cells are more or less sensitive. And this is what we saw. So here you can see in the unirradiated control, normal stem cell migration towards the wound um, at seven days. Um, if we then look at the uh, situation when we added a dose of gamma, this, in this case five gray, you can see that all those cells in the shield are depleted by 5 gray. It's to a much lesser extent than in the migratory region where the cells are completely gone. So this suggested to us that this is a real problem. So this damage is, is actually significant. It's not something that can be ignored. Um, it's obviously going to be um, engaging the DNA repair machinery. And so to finally to test that, we can obviously go back to our DNA repair pathways and we can knock them out now individually and show that if we knock out any of the, this is just three here, just knock out any of the DNA repair enzymes, uh, migration just doesn't happen. It starts and it aborts. So we think here that we've shown that there's a clear link between migration and the accumulation of damage. So our kind of working model is that a migrating stem cell in planarian um, acquires damage and then pauses to repair it. But if you interfere with that with radiation or indeed knock down of the DNA repair pathway, they get stuck and they can't migrate. And so they have this cycle of migration, damage, and repair, which kind of explains some of the kinetics we see as they move towards the wound. Okay, five minutes? Okay, so in the last five minutes, um, I want to go back to talk about epigenetics briefly, because I think um, 
that might be the major interest. So this work has been done by a graduate student in the lab, Yakiniro, supported by earlier work to establish ChIP-seq and PATAC-seq um, as viable methods in, in this system. So Yaka wanted to start identifying enhancer elements and understanding how they might regulate different features of planarian stem cells. In particular, he was interested in identifying enhancers that might be regulated by this set of fate-specific transcription factors I mentioned earlier that drive differentiation down these different lineages. So the first thing he did was to make sure we knew what all the transcription factors were in this animal, because we didn't really have a precise annotation. In fact, it was worse than we realized, because when we went back and we did this, we found we almost doubled the number of annotated transcription factors, mainly by finding uh, more paralogs than we realized they were going to be. And then because we don't have lots of um, technology or to, to identify motifs in the animal itself, we used um, databases to predict motifs that these transcription factors and these transcription factors from uh, families are likely to bind. To cut a long story short, we um, incorporated data from ChIP-seq against uh, K4 monomethylation and K27 acetylation and combined them to try and identify enhancers. We overlapped this with um, a tax seat data, both this peak data, but also footprinting data from the transcription factors. And as a control, we included data from knockdown of the MNL34 ortholog in planarians, which, which, make, which makes this modification, the K4 monomethylation, um, uh, uh, puts the K4 monomethylation uh, mark down. The idea being that if, if these really are enhancers, then knock, knocking down this enzyme should reduce that signal, otherwise they might not be enhanced. Um, and so that just, this just summarizes all that data very quickly. Um, K27, um, K monomethylation at uh, lysine 4 and H3, and then the fact that these things double peak, and they double peak in this interesting pattern associated with enhancers, right? So. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but this is characteristic of active enhancers, the fact that this double peaks um, in this pattern when you load um, monomethylation on, on top of K27 peaks, monomethylation double peaks. Um, then we can look at um, look at enhancer regions after RNAIB enzyme, and we can see we reduce that signal. So we reduce that signal to active enhancers, telling us that that enzyme is actively making this mark. So that suggests that some components of enhancer, uh, like elements in planarians, are also conserved. We didn't want to make that assumption. Um, and of course, our ATAC peaks also overlap with a lot of these enhancer regions. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And in these enhancer regions, we also get um, footprint scores. So um, just to explain, footprint scores are where ATAC signal is interrupted within a peak, presumably because the transcription factor at a particular motif has some presence, so stops insertion. That's the assumption there. So we can computationally take all that data um, and look at any set of genes we want. So if we focus on those transcription factors I mentioned that we, we know from RNAi experiments drive the differentiation of near blasts, um, we don't know how they do it, but we know they do, um, we can start to look at networks between them. And what we find is that it looks like FSTFs that drive fate um, in one particular lineage at the same time are negatively regulating the FSTFs of another fate, which is kind of the thing we predict would be the case. And looking at the RNA-seq and ATAC data together, we can start to make um, networks that prove that to be the case. To independently test this data, we had a really, a, a, we were lucky to have a lot of data and literature. So a lot of people do RNA-seq experiments after RNAi of their transcription factor. So that's a set of predicted targets done in independent labs at a completely different time. So if we take those targets and we just take an observed expected ratio, so, you know, are, are things that are potentially regulated by these transcription factors enriched in our binding site data? They are in every, in every case, um, amazingly so. There's only one that isn't. And that was our control because HOX3A is not expressed in stem cells, right? So that was our control. And actually, this is a really good method if you're working with a system that is, is slightly less developed than the major model organisms. Um, we can recommend this kind of um, close ratio type of approach. I can talk to you about it if you're interested. Um, and we can go into the literature and pull out specific published examples. So here's the transcription neural uh, transcription factor co 
data from some lovely papers from the Zayas lab had shown that this probably regulates uh, PO41, um, which, is a, which is a transcription factor expressed in a set of neurons. When you knock down PO, you get an a, a interruption to proper, proper neural differentiation during regeneration. Um, and you also get a decrease up in, um, in expression of PO after PO RNAi, suggesting there's a relationship. And we can go and find a very nice PO footprint here in what looks like a, an enhancer at the, near the locus. So lastly, this has been really useful also for looking at novel transcription factors. So unlike in, as Yusra was saying, that, that mentioned that lovely paper where the Yamanaka factors are misexpressed to partially reprogram certain cells in a mouse, we would love to understand what the transcriptional control of pluripotency, not differentiation, but pluripotency is. Planarians do not have Yamanaka factors, really. They have maybe one of the four, but none of the others. So it must be something else. And we don't really know how to get at that. Our suspicion is it's somewhere in this huge number of um, unstudied zinc fingers. There's a massive expansion of zinc finger family transcription factors. And here's just one that we found that we thought was very interesting, which is stem cell enriched, called ZF6, which clearly impacts the ability of the stem cells to maintain. It's a very rapid phenotype in this and the stem cells just to go away. Um, okay, so I thank people who did the work on the way, but I also want to thank the rest of my research group who work on many different things, funders, and then two collaborators who really helped with understanding um, ionizing radiation. I'm not an ionizing radiation expert, um, but Mark Hill, Dr. Mark Hill, and his colleague, Dr. James Thompson, helped us make x-rays straight so we could do this, this project. Okay, thank you.